program created by Rio Grande. Plumas County Sheriff's Office calling all cars. Attention all sheriff's cars. Broadcast 221 regarding an attempt murder. Suspect described as a male American, 5 feet 9 or 10 inches, 145 pounds, had dark hair. This man shot the proprietor of a railroad restaurant in Portola at about 3.30 a.m. this date. That's all. Rolls and quits. California residents during 1937. That's one car for every two persons, making California the most highly motorized area in the entire world. Then California must be the world's most highly competitive gasoline market. Is that true, Dr. Lindsley? Yes, but in spite of that fact, one gasoline has so steadily advanced in favor that tonight as I talk with you, it stands on the very pinnacle of official popularity. You couldn't by any chance be referring to real brandy cracks, could you, Doctor? <laughs> Not much difficulty guessing that one, was there? Nearly everyone knows that more police cars, fire engines, ambulances, and other emergency equipment are powered by Rio Grande cracked gasoline wherever it is sold than any other brand. But all may not be aware that officials of the state of California and the federal government also specify the superior motor fuel for their emergency automotive equipment. City, county, state, and federal? Correct. All divisions of government. And for that reason... I know. And for that reason, wise motorists will profit by the experience of these officials who should know the most about gasoline. And do know the most, believe me, because they drive the most and use the most. Friends, let their example guide you into the nearest red and white Rio Grande station. Rio Grande Crack is the most highly endorsed gasoline in the world's biggest gasoline market. The gasoline that is first in public service. Forward to our program, we present a message from Sheriff L.A. Braden of Plumas County. When we consider the large number of persons convicted and sent to prison every year in this state alone, it causes one to wonder at the mental attitude of a man who deliberately commits a crime, knowing that the chances are a thousand to one that he'll be caught and punished. In the case we are to hear tonight, the crime committed was so needless and netted the criminal not one single penny. And yet it cost a man months of suffering. Not one person profited in any way from this crime, proving again that crime is not a paying proposition. The months of grueling work put in by the law enforcement officers in apprehending the criminal and preparing the case against him is another example of the determination of these officers to discourage crime in any form. of the Western Railroad in Portola, a man walks stealthily along the station platform. Something for you, mister? Pack of camels. Thank you, sir. Give me that money. What? You heard me. Give me that money. McIntosh phoned Sheriff Brayton in Quincy. In a matter of minutes, deputies were searching the town, the railroad yards, empty freight cars, and even hobo jungles. Within an hour after the shooting, Sheriff Brayton arrived at Portola. 
Inch by inch, he and his men searched the restaurant where Dilts had been shot. The only evidence of the crime they could find was the pool of blood where Dilts had lain. Next day, Sheriff Braden is joined by J.J. Foley, special agent for the Western Railroad. Hello, Braden. How are you, Foley? I'm tired. Spent the morning phoning all the boys to be on the lookout for the bird who shot Dilts. I rode in with Groom, the chief. I have to put in all my time on this case. And from the looks of things, we're going to have a sweet time of it. Why? So far, all we've got is a crime, not the slightest clue. And can't Lou give you a description? Yeah, the kind that makes your hair get gray before it's time. Doesn't know what the gunman looked like, huh? He hasn't the slightest idea as to the man's coloring, size, features, or clothing. He thinks he wore a gray suit and had on cleaner clothes than the average hobo. How is Lou? Not so good. The bullet pierced a lung. He may not pull through. What does the doctor say? Says it'll be days before you'll know. Well, why don't you let her coast for a while, Sheriff? You've been going since 4 o'clock this morning. Let me take over. I guess you might as well at that. I'm all in. Oh, by the way, here's the bullet they got from Dilt's back. Good. I'll have a test run on it to find out the possible weapon used. <laughs> After train puffed through the sleeping town, Foley and his men checked every car for suspects, hoping that their quarry had not eluded the net thrown out for him. Hour after hour, the officers asked questions, hoping somebody would make a false move or talk out of turn. Every jungle was turned upside down without success. Then, next day, Constable McIntosh brought a woman to the office to talk to Foley. Uh, Jim, uh, this is Mrs. Reese. She's a mortician. She thinks she might have a lead on this case. Well, I can't think of anything I'd rather have right now, Mrs. Reese. Well, it's only possible that I have something worthwhile. On the afternoon of the night Lou Dilts was shot, a man came to my back door. Good evening, lady. wonder if you'd help a fellow out with a bite to eat. Why, I suppose so. Just a moment. I'll see what I have in the icebox. Well, here's a little cold roast All and right. some mashed potatoes, if you think you'd like that. Yeah, that'd be fine if you can spare them. Would you like bread? Yes, ma'am. If you don't mind. Well, just a minute. Say, uh, mind if I sit here on the steps while I eat? Well, no. Go right ahead. Thanks. So he sat there and ate the meat and potatoes and bread I gave him. And I noticed that he had on overalls over his clothes. Did he have on a coat? Yes, I believe he had on a dark coat. He was carrying a jumper and an overcoat. He was cleaner than most fellows who come around. I thought maybe he was one of the road boys who'd been out of work did, for a uh, while. Did he carry anything else that you saw? No, I don't think so. I did notice, though, that he had a bulge in the overcoat pocket such as a gun might make, though I didn't pay any particular attention to it at the time. Was this fellow in a hurry, or did you notice? Yes, I did. I noticed that he appeared nervous, kept looking around as though he expected somebody to come around the corner. Did you notice which way he went when he left your house? Well, I think he went toward town. I found out later that he'd been in my garage. At least somebody had. Is that so? How do you know? Well, I keep the ambulance in the garage, the hearse, rather, and when I went out later in the evening, both doors were open. There were several footprints in the dust inside the garage, and somebody had been inside the hearse. Both doors were open on it, and there were signs that somebody had hidden in there. I see. What did this hobo look like? Well, he kept his head down most of the time, and I couldn't get a very good look at his face, except that I noticed he had exceptionally long eyelashes. But I'd know him anywhere if I ever saw him again. Well, I hope you got the chance, Mrs. Reese. Foley speaking. Uh, Jim, this is Braden at Oroville. Oh, yes, Sheriff. What is it? I have a suspect in that Calder shooting. That's so? What does it look like? Got long eyelashes? Well, yeah, I think he has. Why? That's the description Mrs. Reese gave me. What sort of clothes is he wearing? A dark suit and a gray cap. Okay. Hold him for me and send me pictures. Okay, Jim. Well, how are you feeling today, Lou? Not so good, Jim. Hurting you pretty bad, huh? Yes, pretty bad. Look, Lou... Do you feel well enough to try to identify some pictures? I guess so. Take a look at these. Is that the man who shot you? Well, let, let me see. Nope. No, Jim. 
That's not the man. Well, I sort of hoped that that was the one, Lou. It looks like that fellow's vanished completely. Well, you boys are doing all you can, Jim. Yeah, I know. But just the same, I wish I could get a lead on that bird. Yeah. The doc says you got the bullet out of my back. Yes, I had Roger Green check up on it. It was the Smith & Wesson 44. Mm, no wonder it hurts so. Pretty good-sized slug, all right. We haven't been able to get a line on any gun that might have fired that slug, either. Time's up, Miss Foley. Okay. Well, so long, Lou. I'll drop in later. By the way, Miss Foley, the office has a telephone call for you. All right, thanks. I'll go and see about it. Got a call for me in here, Doc? Yes, I had, Jim. Right over here. Thanks. Hello. Uh, say, Jim, this is Rod Gordon. I just had a talk with Sergeant Washburn at the police station down here in Stockton. He and his partner, Ingalls, have arrested a suspect in the patrol case. Don't tell me there's another one. Yes. And this one's got a Smith & Wesson 44 Special on it. What? Yeah. You better run, take a run down here. And how? Tell Washburn to hang on to him. I'll be right down. Hello, Foley. We got your wire, and Gordon told us you were coming down. Yes, I want to get a look at this suspect you've got. Well, we'll bring him. And if he's sober enough to talk, you may be able to get something out of him. We decided to hold him when we found the gun on him, and then when we got your bulletin yesterday, we phoned Gordon about him. Well, this looks like the first definite thing we've had on this case. Oh, here comes our young gun-toting drunk now. Come on in, Moore. Sit down. All right, thanks, Joe. I'll call you when we get through with him. Okay. What's your name, son? Patrick Moore. Just a gun, Washington? Yeah. Where did you get this gun, Moore? I found it. If that's a gag, it's not a very good one. It's not a gag. Well, where did you find the gun? I found it about 10 days ago in a ditch close to D and R G W yards in Grand Junction. Colorado? Yeah. Ah, uh, you didn't find this gun in a ditch, Moore. This is practically a new gun. Well, it was in a package. It was wrapped up with some other things. What else did you find on him, Washington? Well, we found a fountain pen. Here it is. And a pocketbook and this Swedish coin. Hmm. 1747. Looks like there's some initials on this pen. Yeah, I make out C.S. on it. And that's what it looks like. More. You say these things were in the package? Yes, sir. There was a package laying in a ditch. I was walking along in the dark and I stepped on it. I was with a couple other fellows, so I didn't open it up till I get back to the jungle. And I found this gun and a pen, a sweet half dollar or whatever it is. Got any book, Washburn? Yeah, booked and sentenced to 15 days as Romer Vag. Good. Mind if I take this gun along? I want to get Green to see if that slug we got out of Dilt's back matches this gun. No, we don't care what you do with it. Take it along. <laughs> Portola went fully to show mug pictures of the new suspect to the wounded Diltz. Still dangerously low, Diltz was able to partially identify the pictures as those of the man who had shot him. Sensing that he was on the right track, Foley took the gun to Roger Green of the Bureau of Criminal Identification and Investigation in Sacramento. Roger, here is the gun I think is the one used to shoot Lou Diltz. Let's see what you can find out. Okay. Let me take a look. Hmm. Looks like it might be at that. And here's the slug we took from Diltz. Okay. I've got a record card on that one already. You'll have to fire a test bullet from the gun and compare them. Now for a little digging around in the waist. No, nuts. Where did that thing go? Oh, here it is. Let me see. Well, looks like it to me. Never can tell. They all look alike to the naked eye. At least, practically alike. Well, let's take a look at it with a microscope. There we are. Now, uh, just a little more to the left. Uh, there we are. Mm-hmm. Is it the same? Looks like it. Looks like it. Can't you tell? Well, I wouldn't want to say till I'd had time to study it more. You guys in the ballistics department are positive creatures. Jim, when a human life is at stake, we can't afford to make rash statements. I've seen too many mistakes made by hasty examinations. Offhand, I'd say this gun fired both bullets. But before I'd go into court and swear to that, I'd have to do a lot of studying on it. Let me know. There you are. Now, wait a minute. There's a speck of dust on this test bullet. Hand me that camel hair brush, will you? Sure. 
Sure. Here. What difference could a speck of dust make? Well, under a microscope, it makes a willable difference. Might make the difference between being right and wrong. Well, it still looks like the same bullet to me. Well, that's what I said. Still, I'll have to study it before I'll give you a sure answer. All right. Now, let's check this gun number against the sales card. Now, what's that number? 29512. 29512. Let's see. 2829. No, no. No report of a sale on it. How about Septicle? Well, just a minute. We'll look. You say uh, 29512. That's right. Mm, no. No record of it being stolen. I wonder where that gun came from. Well, it's barely possible that Moore's telling you the truth. I doubt it. I'm going to wire this dope to Groom and get him to check on this gun. Immediately, telegraph and telephone wires began a steady hum as efforts were renewed to trace the gun found in Moore's possession. Meantime, Sheriff Braden and his men were tracing down every available lead that might bring news of the hold-up man's activities. On October 10th, Groom, Foley, and Sergeant Ingalls of the Stockton Police meet to question Moore. I sent for Moore, Groom. He'll be here in a minute. Fine. We'd like to ask him a few questions. What did you find out about that gun, Mr. Groom? Well, it was sold to Wolf and Clark, Fort Worth, Texas, on April 13, 1927. They sold it to Arnold Wolf of Denver, Colorado, in June 1928. Oh, here's more now. Right in here, Moore. Thanks, Joe. Okay. Moore, this is Chief Special Agent Groom of the Western Railroad. He wants to ask you some questions. Go ahead. Moore, the state experts tell me that the gun that fired a bullet into Lou Diltz is the same gun Ingalls here found in your pocket when he arrested you. They're crazy. I don't think so. I don't care what you think. I never shot anybody anywhere. Well, where did you get that gun? I told you I found it. You don't expect us to believe that daffy tale, do you? I don't care whether you believe it or not. You seem to dick seem to have made up your minds anyways. What do I care what you believe? Do you claim you don't know anything about this shooting? Sure I do. If that gun's ever been fired, I don't know anything about it. I know I never fired it. Where are you from, Moore? I was born in South Dakota. Parents living? No. Any brothers or sisters? No. You ever been in trouble before? Got in a jam in the Army once. What for? For getting drunk. Oh. Anything else? No. Where did you work last, Moore? Mm, Palisades, Colorado. When was that? Mm, September. How much money did you make? Oh, three, four dollars. That the last work you had? Yeah, but I made a little money playing poke and shooting craps. When were you in Fort Worth, Texas last? Oh, about a year ago. How long did you stay there? I got off in one train, got on another one. Ever used the name of Wolf? No. Ever been in Denver? Once. When? A mm, couple of months ago. Know anybody named Wolf living there? No. You still claim you found this stuff at Grand Junction? Sure I do. Where were you on the night of September 29th? I was in Port Tola. What? Uh, no. no uh, I got in there about 10 o'clock on the 28th and left about 8 o'clock on that same night. You're sure about that? Of course I'm sure. You're positive you weren't in Fort Tola at 3 o'clock on the morning of September 29th? Sure, I'm positive. Okay, Moore, we're going to check your story. If it's true, okay. If it's not, we're going to send you up. Then began the man-sized job of checking Moore's statement. On October 11th, Arnold Wolf, a reputable Denver citizen, returned gun to Wolf and Clark. A few days later, word came back. Wolf and Clark claimed no record of returned gun in their file. On October 12th, Foley explained his case to District Attorney Stanley Young. Complaint charging Moore with assault with deadly weapon issued. October 14th. Moore lodged in Quincy Jail. Preliminary hearing October 25th. October 15th. Lee Thomas looks at photographs of Patrick Moore. Joe, sure, that's the man who came to the Russian tier and asked me for some salt. I gave it to him in a paper napkin. That was the afternoon before Lou Diltz was shot. October 16th, Deputy Don Williams tells Jim Foley... Well, that's a picture of the bird I saw in a refrigerator car on the night of September 28th. He had on overalls over a dark suit. Well, sure, I let him ride. I didn't have anything on him. October 25th, preliminary hearing of Pat Moore. Pat Moore held to answer in Superior Court. November 2nd, Special Agent Groom received word from Wolf and Clark. 
have found record of Smith & Wesson gun returned by Arnold Wolfe. Gun later resold to Garden Schwartz Brothers, Durango, Colorado. On November 6th, Garden Schwartz wired... Gun bought September 1933 by C.N. Swenson. Family living in Durango now. Photographs Mark Moore, which you sent us, not the man. All right, Moore. Now we want the truth. We know this gun belonged to a man named Swenson. We've got pretty good reason to suspect that he never was in Grand Junction. His family reports that he hasn't been heard from in months. Now, what's the truth on this? I told you the truth. No, no, you didn't. We've sent your pictures to every place you said you've been to. We found that you were in Durango, Colorado, at the same time this Swenson was. And you both disappeared at the same time. What did you do with Swenson? I never did nothing with him. I don't know him. Yeah? Well, take a look at that picture. Ever see that man before? Yeah, yeah, I think so. But yeah, that's Whitey. I met him in Thistle, Utah. Hmm, Thistle, Utah, eh? Well, that Selden Swenson and you met him in Durango, Colorado, didn't you? No, I didn't. I'll tell you how it was. You see, you see, Whitey and me, we met up with a fellow named Blackie. Hmm, colorful story. Go on. Well, this this Whitey was a fighter. He was going up to Frisco to get him some fights. Well, uh, when the three of us got here to Portola, we was killing time. One day, Whitey, he comes to Blackie and he tells him he's in a jam and he had to beat it. He leaves his package with Blackie and, well, that's the last we've seen of him. Hmm. What's the rest of it? Well, we get to drinking a little, and we hop the reaper on the night of the 28th and feed it to Stockton. We was fresh out of funds when we got there, so we opened the package. Yeah, and... wait. Don't tell me. Let me get. You found the fountain pen, the Swedish coin, and the gun. Yeah, that's right. Ah, listen, Moore. I've heard some goofy tales in my life, but this one takes the cake. <laughs> Uh, yes, sir. 
My brother uh, bought it just before he left home. He recognized the little nick in the barrel uh, on top there. I offer this as People's Exhibit C for identification. So entered. Uh, thank you, Mr. Swenson. Your witness. No questions. Call Roger Green. Roger Green? Raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear the evidence you're about to give in this case to be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Take a stand. Mr. Green, state your occupation, please. Ballistic expert, California State Bureau of Criminal Identification and Investigation. Are your duties concerned with the investigation of firearms to determine whether a given weapon has fired a given bullet? They are. And did you, on or about October 5th of last year, Mr. Green, examine a Smith & Wesson revolver delivered to you by one James Foley? I did. I show you People's Exhibit C and ask you, is that the same gun? It is. And how do you identify the gun? By the number. 29512, and by this peculiar nick on the barrel. And did you on that date fire a test bullet from this gun? I did. And did you compare that bullet with another bullet given you by James Foley? I did. And what was the result of the comparison of those bullets? Both bullets were fired from the same gun. I show you a bullet here. Is that the bullet given you by James Foley? It is. And did he tell you where he got the bullet? He said it had been taken from the body of Lewis Dill. Objected to is hearsay testimony. Sustained. That is all, Mr. Green. Thank you. Your witness. No questions. Call Lewis Diltz. Lewis Diltz? It'll be necessary to clear a passage in the court. Mr. Diltz is confined to a wheelchair. Do you solemnly swear the testimony you are about to give in this case to be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Uh, Mr. Diltz. Where were you at 3 o'clock on the morning of September 29th? I was at work in the company restaurant at Portola. And what, if anything unusual, happened on that night? Why, I was shot. Uh, Mr. Diltz, I want you to look around this courtroom. Do you see the man in this room who shot you? Yes. Can you identify the man? Yes. That is the man who, who shot me. That man more... Sitting right there. Your Honor, the state rests. In just a moment, we will hear the conclusion of this case. One thing we learn during a trade slump is to make every penny speak for itself. To get the most for our money. And that is one of the reasons so many sober-minded motorists are driving into red and white Rio Grande stations these days for low-cost per mile police car performance, Rio Grande cracked gasoline. You will be convinced, if you try the various brands, that the officials of city, county, California state, and federal governments know what they are about when they specify Rio Grande to power their emergency equipment. And when you learn, as tens of thousands have, that this superior gasoline gives you more for less money. You will stick to Rio Grande Cracked for the sake of your pocketbook and the thrill of police car performance. Patrick Moore was found guilty as charged and on June 4th received a sentence prescribed by law. He is now serving time in San Quentin. Four months later, Seldon Swenson was located in Utah. He told of being slugged and robbed by Moore and a companion. Thus was the last vestige of doubt removed as to the guilt of Patrick Moore. His was another crime that did not pay. Plumas County Sheriff's Office calling all cars, attention all sheriff's cars to cancellation on broadcast 221 regarding an attempt murder. Suspect this case is now in custody. That's all. Rolls and quits. This is your narrator, Frederick Lindsley, bidding you good night for Rio Grande. <laughs> <laughs> 